Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill. Today, I have a special guest who I've long admired, and this is our first official meeting, uh, but you're going to hear all about gut health and why the gut is connected to every single organ in the body. And if you're suffering from chronic disease that seems totally far removed from the gut, heart disease, cancer, autoimmunity, inflammation of any type, you're going to want to hear this podcast today because we're going to dive in uh, as to how the gut is connected to all of these things. So Dr. Gundry, welcome and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Joe. Great to be here and love to talk about the gut. Yes, me too. So let me introduce Dr. Stephen Gundry. He's a founder and director of the International Heart and Lung Institute in Palm Springs, California, and the Center for Restorative Medicine in Palm Springs and Santa Barbara. After a distinguished surgical career as a professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda, one of the blue zones, right? <laughs> Loma Linda University, Dr. Gundry changed his focus to curing modern disease by a Dietary Changes. He's the author of New York Times bestselling author, or sorry, bestselling book, The Plant Paradox, The Plant Paradox Cookbook, The Plant Paradox Quick and Easy, and The Longevity Paradox, along with national bestsellers, The Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, The Energy Paradox, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, and Unlocking the Keto Code, and more than 300 articles published in peer-reviewed journals on using diet and supplements to eliminate heart disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, and many, many other things. And we're going to dive into that today. He's the host of the weekly Dr. Gundry podcast and founder of wellness brand Gundry MD. He lives with his wife, Penny, and their dogs in Palm Springs and Monticello, California. Monticello, California. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know, that's a tough one. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. And, and what an amazing career with all those books and then the previous career, cardiothoracic surgery. So I always love to ask my guests, um, what was your journey to medicine and how did you really transform into this integrative holistic um, doc where we look at root cause? Tell us your journey. Well, real briefly, I decided to become a doctor after reading a book when, in, in fourth grade in my uh, public school library called All About You. And uh, I decided to become a doctor that day. Um, so I uh, had, uh, I went undergraduate at Yale back in the dark ages. And in those days, we were actually able to design our own major. And it was basically, you, you did a master's thesis. And I chose uh, to, uh, my hypothesis was you could take a grade A, manipulate its food supply and manipulate its environment and prove you to arrive at a human being. Um, I actually defended my thesis and got an honors and I give it to my parents and went off to become a famous heart surgeon. So um, I eventually wound up at Loma Linda, uh, California, at Loma Linda University Medical School. And I was a famous heart surgeon who, among other things, I was famous for xenotransplantation, pediatric transplantation, and operating on people that nobody else wanted to. And um, there are a few idiots like me. And so back in the late 90s, I was referred to a gentleman who I call Big Ed in all my books. Um, Big Ed was 48 years old. He had inoperable coronary artery disease. He was from Miami, Florida. And he, all of his blood vessels were clogged up. You couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't do bypasses because there wasn't any place to put a new vessel. And he went around the country looking for idiots like me to operate on him. And everybody turned him down. And I'm kind of on one of those stops. And he spent six months looking for somebody. And he finally wound up in my office after about six months. And I looked at his angiogram, the cardiac catheterization of his heart from six months earlier in Miami. And I said, well, look, you know, I don't want to break your heart, but I agree with everybody else. There's nothing I can do for you. They're, they're right. And he said, well, look, what you don't know is I've been on a diet for six months time and I've lost 45 pounds. Now, the reason he's nicknamed Big Ed is he was 265 pounds when I met him. Um, but he had lost 45 pounds. And he says and I've gone to a health food store and I'm taking a bunch of supplements. And he literally had brought in a uh -huh. big the bag. bag. <laughs> yeah, the bag. And he says, you know, maybe I did something in here. And I'm, 
you know, I'm scratching my professor beard and going, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not really going to help this. And I know what you've done with all those supplements. You've made expensive urine, which is what I used to believe. And he says, well, you know, come on, I've come all this way, blah, blah, blah. Why don't we get a new angiogram? Why don't we get a new cardiac catheterization? You know, I'm going, ah, you know, don't get your hopes up. Uh -huh. Okay. So the next day we get an angiogram. And in six months time, this guy has reversed 50% of the blockages in his heart. They're gone. And I'm looking at this and, you know, I'm looking at the two and I'm going, you know, I've, this is impossible. I've never seen anything like this. And so the next thing I go is, that, wait a minute, you know, tell me about this diet of yours. Uh -huh. And so he starts rattling off what he's doing. And I'm going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's my thesis from Yale University of what, you know, an ancient man ate. And I said, what the heck? And so I said, well, wait a minute, let me look at those supplements. Now, I was famous for protecting the heart in a bucket of ice water for 48 hours for heart transplant. And I was famous because I had this concoction of stuff that I would put down the veins and arteries of the heart to protect it. And I start looking through his supplements and a bunch of the stuff I'm putting down the veins and arteries of the heart, he's swallowing. Uh -huh. And it never occurred to me to swallow the dumb uh -huh. thing. So um, why it's so pointed is I was... 70 pounds overweight, even though I was running seven, uh, 30 miles a week, going to the gym one hour a day. I operated with migraine headaches. I had pre-diabetes. I had hypertension. I had such bad arthritis in my knees. I wore braces to run. And uh, so I called my parents uh, and said, hey, do you still have my thesis? And they said, yeah, you know, it's in the shrine. And I said, well, send it up to me. And I put myself on that program and started swallowing a bunch of supplements that I used to put down the veins and arteries. And I lost 50 pounds my first year and so on and so forth. So I started putting my patients who I operated on, on this program so that they would never have to get another operation. Because quite frankly, the vast majority of people, five to seven years later, you're getting new stents or new bypasses and I said, there's got to be a better way. So after about a year of doing this at Loma Linda and seeing the exact same results that I was seeing on myself, I said, gosh, you know, I've got this all wrong. Instead of operating on my patients and then teaching them how to eat to avoid me in the future, I need to teach them how to eat and I'll never have to operate on them in the first place which is really stupid for- um, You're out of a job. <laughs> yeah. So I literally, at the height of my career, resigned my position at Loma Linda, and I set up uh, a clinic here in Palm Springs where I just asked patients, look, every three months, uh, first of all, I want to tell you, I want to take some foods away from you. I want to give you some foods. I want to send you to Costco or Trader Joe's. There wasn't an Amazon back then buy some supplements. Um, I want to do blood work on you every three months that insurance will pay for. And let's see what happens. And of course, I guess the rest is history. But uh, for a career decision at, at the top of your career, it was a really stupid move. But but I kept persisting. And my wife uh, said, you know, this is really stupid, but um, if we're going to do this, let's do it. So there you go. That's how it all started. Wow. I love that story in so many ways. First of all, I always say curiosity is the hallmark of genius. And you clearly from way back, you never lost that you still have it. And that I yeah. think is one of the things that makes great, not only physicians, but great scientists, because as we say, well, what if, or we ask these questions, right? And if we stop learning and stop asking the questions, then we get stagnant and we just do surgery or do whatever we've been told to do forever. So first of all, I love that. And that shows what a brilliant person you always have been and continue to be. But second, I always, I find interesting. My experience with medicine has also been that um, we're taught in medical school, oh, patients won't change their diet. So why even try, right? So we're yeah. kind of like jaded to come out to like, don't even go there because our patients won't be willing. And that's kind of sad because there's so much there and there are patients that are willing. And then if we are 
passionate and we can show the data, obviously it's so powerful. And I feel like there's probably better education now, 20 years after I graduated, but it's still, um, to me, it's always been sad that the, our medical education didn't talk more about um, patient and diet, because again, we weren't, at least for me, it was more like total parenteral nutri nutrition. And that was it, right? <laughs> TBN. Well, interesting. I was, um, I was just recently on uh, Mark Hyman's podcast. And his daughter is a is a third year medical student, and so he mentioned to me, he says, "So I, I said, uh, you know, honey, what what do you learn in in uh, about the microbiome?" And she said, uh, "What do you mean?" And he says, "What are they teaching you?" Uh -huh. She said, "Absolutely nothing. We we have not been taught anything about the microbiome." And he went, "Holy cow! You know what?" You know, would think because there are hundreds, thousands of articles now, which oh, is a yeah. good transition. Let's talk about because you and I know diversity is king, and that's such a core, core concept in the gut. Let's talk about that. Tell us a little bit about why is diversity so critical in our microbiome, and why does it have to do with the rest of the body? So, <clears throat> Hippocrates, you know, twenty five hundred years ago, said all disease begins in the gut. And uh, I've now been spending 25 years trying to figure out how he was right. And he was right. In fact, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but behind me. I love uh, it. I saw the beginning. I didn't see the last word, which is. The, the road to health is paved with good intentions, uh, intestines. <laughs> and it's it's so true. Um, the, you know, we've, we've only really recently discovered that there's this tropical rainforest uh, living inside of us with, you know, a hundred trillion organisms that thanks to the human microbiome project, we actually know are there. Um, we used to think that the human intestine was a hollow tube and we swallowed some stuff and digestive enzymes and juices and acid extracted some stuff and whatever was left over we pooped out along with a few bacteria and boy how wrong we were um and really the part of gut check to me is, that's so exciting is that now that we know about these guys and we can individual what what happens with this incredible community it's like any ecosystem, the more diverse that ecosystem is, the more one species depends on another species and one species can take over for another species if there is a perturbation in the ecosystem. We now know that the whole same thing happens in our gut. And what's startling, I think, to most people and apparently should be to medical students, is that most of what we thought and we're trained in medical school is going to happen to us from any disease standpoint is under the control of one way or another of our microbiome and on our gut. And to me, at least, the most empowering thing is you choose the disease process and you can change it by changing the gut. It's, I mean, it's really exciting. Um, and no one could have even imagined this except Hippocrates, apparently. Right. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Right, way back if we would have listened, so true. I mean, autoimmune is a classic one because everything on the immune, eighty percent of our gut, you know, is or our immune system is lining the gut, and so so yeah. much happens there. I say it's like Vegas, right? What happens there, except it doesn't stay there. <laughs> it, it affects the whole body. Um, you obviously, from your cardiovascular surgical point of view, have a, had have had a big interest in the heart. Tell us about heart-gut connection. Is there any specifics there that 
Well, again, it was kind of big ed that really you know, made me rethink this. Um, interestingly enough, one of the great fathers of heart surgery, Michael DeBakey, who I had the pleasure of knowing while he was alive, um, he always said that cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease, that cholesterol was an innocent bystander, and that um, how how right I think he was. Uh, I've used the example in another book. Um, let's suppose I'm an alien sent down to observe what's happening on earth and to report back to high command. And as I'm looking around earth, we'll choose Los Angeles for an example. Uh, I notice that every time there's a car accident, there's an ambulance so that I could certainly report back to high command. I'm pretty sure that ambulances are the cause of, of car accidents because every time there's a car accident, there's an ambulance. So association does not mean causation. And I think DeBakey was saying that uh, cholesterol was the ambulance. And it, cholesterol is, a, is basically, I tell patients, a, a spackling compound. Yes. And it's there to spackle pat holes that are caused by inflammation and that um, inflammation is actually the cause of the problem. And what's interesting, I think, where did the inflammation come from? Well, the inflammation actually came from leaky gut. And again, it all gets back to Hippocrates. So uh, I would have thought that this was saw was put to death to the cholesterol theory or hypothesis at the American Heart Association this year, where uh, low-dose coltracine, which a lot of people have heard of as a gout medication, low-dose coltracine is an anti-inflammatory sub, uh, uh, substance. And low-dose coltracine in maximally statin medically treated patients produced a 30% reduction in addition to what they had achieved before just because it blocked inflammation. And the other thing that well-meaning physicians don't know is that statin drugs don't work by lowering your LDL or ApoB. Statin drugs work by blocking toll-like receptors, TLRs, which call inflammation into play, cytokines. And we didn't know this initially, but I just had a debate with a very well-meaning cardiologist who just stood by and said, no, 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 it, you know, it's lowering Apple B that is the cause of all this goodness. And I go, that's a side effect. Come on. <laughs> so. Oh, gosh, so I couldn't agree folks. more. And I love that you're uh, sharing that because it really is um, a lot of these drugs. Interesting, too, a lot of the drugs that we've used actually have their action on the microbiome when we didn't even know it. Right. And then we're seeing that uh, downstream effect. Um, and what you're describing is this endothelial dysfunction, right? The lining of the vessels, leaky gut, leaky brain, leaky blood vessels, and all of this stuff then gets that cholesterol spackling that you described. Yeah. And it's really just sticky inflamed um, uh, endothelium that draws the cholesterol to try to heal the process. And then of course the, the stuff you saw with the cardiovascular disease, but it didn't really start with just an elevated cholesterol. So I love that you're really describing that clearly. Um, so fascinating. And often I think autoimmune, whatever we call that, obviously that's the immune system gone awry and attacking self, but even on the endothelial level, a lot of it is really immune inflammation, autoimmune related. And we can actually track that back to the cytokines and um, it's so fascinating. So um, one thing you mentioned earlier that I wanted to come back to is your, um, you were famous for keeping those hearts alive for transplants and you put that solution in there and those nutrients. And then you find out this guy, uh, Tom was uh, Ed, Ed or Tom. Big Ed, yeah, yeah. Big, Ed. Big, Ed. Big Ed was taking these. What are some of the most core nutrients for the heart? Um, I would love to know your list of the top four or five things that you think are critical for, for the heart. Well, uh, not so much for the heart, but if I was going to have anybody take uh, a few supplements, and I've talked about this, vitamin D is number one. Uh, one of the fascinating things about vitamin D is that vitamin D is essential for uh, preventing leaky gut. And I go into it in gut check in more detail than I have in the past, but vitamin D, we have at the, at the base of our crypts in the microvilli and 
we can get into anatomy if we want, but let's not bore everybody. Um, we have a bunch of stem cells at the base of all these crypts. And the crypts are at the base of microvilla. And the reason uh, the wall of our gut is a tennis court in surface area is because we basically have a shag carpet in our intestines of these microvilli. And at the base of these are a collection of bacteria and stem cells. And those stem cells repopulate the one layer lining of our gut. But the stem cells are critically sensitive to vitamin D. And if you don't have enough vitamin D, the stem cells basically sit there and twiddle their thumbs and say, I didn't know there was a problem. What do you want me to do? But vitamin D actually kind of shoves them into action and differentiate. And early on, 80% of my practice is now autoimmune patients who really have not done well with uh, traditional medicine or even, you know, with uh, uh, traditional treatments of autoimmune disease, um, anyhow, biologics, which are transplant drugs, folks. Um, and, you know, I'll tell my patients, I say, I didn't do a heart transplant on you. When the ding dong are you doing on a transplant yes. drug? And that tends to get their attention. Uh -huh. Um so the, the interesting thing is all of these people have low vitamin Ds. And we've done a horrible disservice in teaching people what a normal vitamin D level should be. Um, we've I was taught, that, oh my gosh, once you get above 80 nanograms per milliliter of vitamin D, it's toxic and you know, it's horrible. And in fact, that's not the case. Um, the University of San Diego, University of California, San Diego, which has a huge vitamin D research unit, thinks the average American should be on 9,600 international units of vitamin D, uh, international units of uh, vitamin D3 a day. 10,000 international units. And the, the recommendation is 600. Yeah. And I, I make all of my patients have a vitamin D level above 100. Quest and Cleveland Heart Lab now say 150 is absolutely normal. And I completely agree with that. So vitamin D. The other thing that, again, I guess gets back to heart health. We're one of the few animals that don't manufacture our own vitamin C. And normally vitamin C, uh, fun fact, is manufactured with five enzymes from glucose, turn glucose into vitamin C. And there are five genes that code for these enzymes. We have uh, all five genes, but the fifth gene is what's called a ghost gene. It's turned off. Uh, us, New World monkeys, and guinea pigs, the fifth gene is turned off. So what? Well, we think we turned it off because we were exposed to large amounts of vitamin C containing foods in the jungle. And so glucose is really good as a fuel for, among other things, storing fat. So it would be silly if you had plenty of vitamin C to waste glucose in making vitamin C. So we think that's why it happened. Well, vitamin C is essential to repair breaks in collagen. And putting on my heart surgeon hat, when blood vessels flex, collagen is the rebar in our blood vessels. And that collagen gets exposed. And if you have vitamin C, you will re-knit that collagen back. Um, uh, my friend Bill Sardi, who's now passed from COVID uh, a few years ago, showed that you could breed rats with the same genetic defect as humans, where they do not manufacture vitamin C, and they will live half as long as a normal rat. Uh, ooh. If you put vitamin C in their water, so that they're drinking their vitamin C, they will live a normal rat's life as long as vitamin C is in their water. And he did some fun calculations that would predict that if we had a continuous source of vitamin C, uh, we would live about 252 years on average. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so Time release vitamin C, I think, is another really neglected essential nutrient. 
And luckily, time release vitamin C is cheap. It's easy to afford. And I have all my patients take a thousand milligrams of time release vitamin C once or twice a day. If that's really inconvenient, get yourself some chewable vitamin C tablets and just chew it four times a day. So uh, that's two things that are really essential. Well, I love it because these are not expensive and they're so accessible for every American, every human being. It's not a difficult thing. And it reminds me back my history. I had breast cancer at 25, Crohn's and celiac at 26. And guess what? I had a very severe genetic impairment of VDR, which is the vitamin D receptor. And I look back as you, I hear you talk. I know multiple things that contributed to that, but I am sure one of them was my severe deficiency of vitamin D going into that. And then of course, chemotherapy caused the leaky gut, which caused my predisposition towards Crohn's to become activated. Now I'm free 20 years from Crohn's, I don't have it anymore. But I'm really, as you talk, I'm very much aware of the fact of how much vitamin D had an effect on my own health because I was probably severely deficient, not knowing I had that VDR gene. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, in my practice, uh, in Southern California, 80% of people who walk through the door are vitamin D deficient. And it's like, everybody goes, but that's impossible. You know, right. it's, it's funny, <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny all the time. Right. And the problem is, of course, we've been convinced that we got to cover up with sunscreen and we got to protect ourselves with long clothing. And the the exact opposite is true. But quite frankly, <clears throat> you really can't get enough vitamin C just by being out in the sun unless you're like Joseph Mercola walking in a Speedo for right. two hours a day. For <laughs> in the of sun. Oh, <laughs> so, so good. And like I said, I love the practicality of this D and C so simple for people to get. Um, you talk in your book, um, which we're going to talk at the end where people can get your new book, Gut Check, um, but about cultures and other cultures that sometimes they do a better job of Americans at getting the micronutrients and diversity. What are some of the things that you've seen in other cultures or continents um, that are really key to maintaining how healthy gut that maybe we don't do well or that we're just starting to do? Well, one of the things that is fascinating to me, uh, first of all, it sounds trite, but most of these cultures eat food whole. And everybody says you're supposed to eat a whole food diet, but we forget that the word should be actually, we should eat foods whole. And uh, we, these people eat a lot of tubers, quite frankly. The other thing that's striking is that almost all of these cultures eat fermented foods. And uh, things as simple as uh, yogurts, things as simple as cheeses. We forget that cheeses are fermented foods. And I spent a whole chapter debunking the blue zones. Um, they, I think, should be called white zones. And uh, I'm the only nutritionist who spent most of my career living in the only blue zone in the United States. So, right. <laughs> so you can know a little bit about what I talk about. I, I have a funny story in the book when I was recruited to Loma Linda and uh, I'm, I'm not an Adventist, but I was recruited and I met with the dietitians uh, and the diet was 50% fat. It was mostly cheeses and yogurts and eggs. And I'm going, what the heck? You're killing my patients. You know, I'm a heart surgeon and you're killing them. And they said, look, Sonny, uh, you know, we're some of the Yes, Sonny, <laughs> we're some of the longest living people in the world. Why don't you just shut up and pay attention? And the other thing that struck me years later is everybody says, well, you know, they eat all this uh, plant protein and they eat a lot of nuts. They We have nut everything at Loma Linda. But they, th their main plant protein is texturized vegetable protein, TVP. What's fascinating is it's defatted soy that ex is extruded under high temperature and high pressure so that the really nasty compounds in soy, lectins, are destroyed. And nobody wants to point out that, boy, the Adventists look a lot smarter than you guys think. They're not sitting around eating tofu. Yeah. They're actually decontaminating their lectin-rich food by pressure yeah. cooking. So, I didn't anyway. know that. That makes so much sense. Yeah. So speaking of food, um, what is the optimal dietary um, or diet for the gut? What are some of the principles that you would recommend? Wow. Um, well, one of the things that I think 
made a real impression on me is uh, the the Sonnenberg team, the husband and wife team from Stanford. Everybody knows that prebiotic fiber is really important for our gut microbiome. It's what the gut microbiome eats. And that prebiotic fiber should be actually soluble fiber, not insoluble fiber, number one. Uh, ins insoluble fiber, things like, uh, for instance, one of the best sources is Jerusalem artichokes, sometimes sunchokes, uh, artichoke hearts, uh, the cruciferous, not cruciferous vegetables, which are great in themselves, but the vegetables like chicory based Um one of the easiest things to find on almost all grocery stores now is radicchio, that what people call Italian red lettuce. I'm shocked when I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, in Italy or France that every salad I think I have ever been given has chicory in it, whether it's radicchio, whether it's Belgian endive, whether it's frisee, whether it's chicory, every salad. And you start going, what the heck? You know, why are these guys eating this stuff? Well, it's a great source of prebiotic fiber. But getting back to the Sonnenbergs, they took volunteers and they gave them a ton of prebiotic fiber, primarily in the form of inulin, which is in chicory. And they looked at their gut microbiome diversity and they looked at their inflammatory markers and they didn't see any change. And you go, well, that's weird. So they took an additional group of volunteers, gave them the same prebiotic fiber, but this time they gave them fermented foods, primarily in the form of kefirs, vinegars, uh, yogurts. And it was only with the addition of these fermented foods that they then saw with the prebiotic fiber, the gut diversity improve and the inflammatory markers go down. Wow. And so um, I almost hate the expression, but it really does take a village to get what we need. So most people think of fermented foods as a great source of probiotics, friendly bacteria. They're not. Uh, they are a great source of postbiotics, which are the products of bacterial fermentation. And they're also, as I talk about in the in the chapter, uh, dead men tell no tales, but dead bacteria do. And it turns out that dead bacteria are this amazing communication system to our living bacteria about what's there and what they should do. And it's just shocking to see what happens. So, so yeah eat fermented foods. All of these cultures eat fermented foods. It's easy to do. I have, my wife and I have probably 10 different vinegars that we alternate. Get yourself some goat yogurt or sheep yogurt, not the flavored or coconut yogurt, and have yourself some traditional, you know, fermented cheeses. Believe it or not, Parmesan cheese, Pecorino is great for you. Oh, Heart is, surgeon saying that. Yeah, exactly. This is so great. And I love that you mentioned a couple of things as postbiotics. And um, my work on a little bit of gut cardiovascular was that short chain fatty acids, the butyrate production, those postbiotics that are so core to anti-inflammatory. And you, now we can actually measure those in patient's stool or in some of the testing. Um, but I see frequently that butyric acid is very, very low. And that's one of the most powerful anti-inflammatories. And it comes from butter and cheese and also postbiotics. Um, the other thing you mentioned I thought was so profound and important for patients and, and people to hear today is that dead bacteria can talk to us because we thought for years, in fact, as I've been teaching about diversity and acromancia, which is one of the keystone strains, of course, that tells if we have diversity or not. So if you lack acromancia totally, you're going to have less mucosal barrier, less diversity in general. And for years, you couldn't culture this anaerobe because it's very hard to culture and give. Now there is a company out there that has acromancia. It's dead. It is um, completely pasteurized. It's a dead probiotic, but their evidence is showing that that dead probiotic, as you mentioned, has a powerful anti-inflammatory effect on the body, even though it's dead. So all this controversy years ago, of do we take our probiotics with food, without food, does the HCL kill them? Maybe it doesn't matter, right? Because the dead probiotic is still going to have that signal to the immune system. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I use the example, uh, I we have some rescue dogs and a few of them are, are male dogs. 
And uh, of course, they like to mark things, but more importantly, they like to sniff what other people's pee, uh, dog's pee uh, has. And you go, what the heck? Why do you spend, you know, stop sniffing? What you, what's so interesting? Well, that urine contains lots of information that they get that we have no idea what they're smelling. And what we now realize is that our living bacteria can read the code on these dead bacterial cell wall, and they literally get information from it. And just because we can't read that doesn't mean that somebody else, the bacteria can't. Wow, amazing. Now, you mentioned <laughs> about 80% of your practice now is autoimmune, which is just becoming an epidemic. Women, yep. four times the amount of men. Um, what yep. would you say for autoimmune disease? Is there a few pearls that you would could give us here that you give to your patients with autoimmunity related to the gut? Well, the good news is that, uh, and I've, I've published this data, um, within a year, 90 plus percent of people with autoimmune disease uh, are in remission. Um, they're off of their meds, uh, which is pretty doggone good. Um, the first thing to realize is that everyone with autoimmune disease has leaky gut, period. Um, get over it. A hundred percent of my patients with autoimmune disease, whether or not they're eating wheat or gluten, have antibodies to the various components of wheat, wheat germagglutinin, all the different forms of gluten, non-gluten proteins, 100%. So, and I have people who've been gluten-free for 10 years who have massive antibodies, still IgG antibodies to gluten. The good news is, excuse me, this goes away. Uh, it completely resolves. And uh, does that mean you can have it again? Uh, maybe if you go to Europe, where they don't have glyphosate. Uh, here in the United States, uh, I could tell you stories uh, that we don't have time for, but glyphosate is just a disaster for us. Uh, it's one of the big mischief makers in autoimmune disease, and it's everywhere in our food supply. But so we get people to give up grains. Uh, the only safe grains in my practice are sorghum and millet. They don't have a hull. They don't have lectins. We ask them to pressure cook their beans and their lentils. We get to, we have them throw away their peanuts and cashews. Um, sorry, and we ask them to peel and deseed tomatoes and peppers, and uh, because they contain lectins. And we've had a you know a great run, and that's how people end up in in my clinic. But the it's all in the book to, you know, if you've got an autoimmune disease, uh, it is a fixable problem, I, I promise. And does it take some work? Sure. Uh, but the good news is we'll get you back a lot of the foods that you want. Uh, the other thing I think is striking, great number of my autoimmune patients react to all forms of dairy and both egg yolk and egg whites. Um, the other thing that surprises a lot of people is that almonds, even almond flour, even blanched almonds are problematic for a number of my patients with autoimmune disease. Gosh, I agree on all fronts. And it's stuff that is so important, but not many people are talking about it to the level that you are. So thank you. Um, Dr. Gundry, the last question for you is personally, you've done a lot of stuff in transformation and you talked about your journey after your patient, you saw this transformation. What do you feel like is your most important key to longevity and health for you personally? Oh, uh, gosh, I think you, you, you hit on it early on is one of the things that is interesting in traveling around the world, looking at these long lived populations is these super old people have, have a mission. Yeah. They, they firmly believe that they are there to help their community, to help, people understand what got them there and i guess it's this it's this discovery uh, we we joke um i've written a lot of books and my editor always wants an outline before i start writing and i refuse to give her an outline 
And she said, well, you can't write a book without an outline. And I said, well, if I give you an outline, but guess what? I'm going to, everything's going to change by the end of the book. She said, just, just write something down and, you know, humor me. Cause I'm, you know, I'm not going to prove you doing this without an outline. And of course, every time I write a book, uh, I go down rabbit holes of discovery and, you know, I don't write a new book unless I've got something important to tell people. And, you know, I still see patients six days a week, you know, in my mid seventies. And so the reason I do this is you get to see, I get to see miracles nearly every day. And so that's, I love that so much. I'm just in the midst of reading a book by Gladys McCary, which was, I think she lived to be 106. She was a medical doctor. She talks about the life well lived in the first part of her book is the juice. It's the thing you're talking about. And I'm talking about what gets us up in the morning, what gives us passion and purpose and meaning in life. And how do we use that juice to transform people's lives and inspire? And clearly you've got the juice. <laughs> so I love that. I loved how she said it. Cause at 106, she's like, you got to have the juice. Yeah, that, that's very yeah. true. That's very yeah. true. So, well, thank you for your amazing work in the world. Um, gut check is coming out January 6th. So whether you hear this right before or right after that, you can get your own. January copy. 9th, Tuesday, January 9th. Thanks. Daniel and I, yeah, always Tuesdays, uh, Harper, um, uh, it's one of the Harper subsidiaries and January 9th, you can get it. Where can people find you? Where can they get the book? Well, they can get the book wherever books are sold. Please go to your local bookseller. They really suffered during COVID as we all know, and they need our help, but Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, uh, the usual spots. Uh, drgundry.com, gundrymd.com is my supplement and food company, the Dr. Gundry podcast, wherever you get your podcasts and my YouTube channels. So, um, and if I don't pop up on whatever you're viewing every morning on your cell phone, I've done something wrong, I guess. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, go follow Dr. Gundry, find his resources, check out his website, and please get the book. This is going to be a game changer for all of you that are suffering from autoimmunity or really any chronic medical condition. Dr. Gundry, thank you for taking your juice and making such a difference in the world.